Harvard are right on the Deccan Plateau, just like Bangalore. It is uh, very high up on the plateau. 750 meters above sea level means we have wonderful weather for most of the year. So the summers are not very hot. The winters are very cool and pleasant. And we have a, a not too harsh uh, monsoon season either. Hubli Tharwar is a fairly large uh, urban center. Apart from Bangalore, uh, in Karnataka, we have three urban centers which have populations of about 10 lakhs. That's Mangalore, Mysore, and Hubli Tharwar. So you see, uh, it's a fairly large uh, urban uh, center here. Now, as I mentioned a short while ago, Dharwad is an educational hub. There are so many educational institutions here. And the second oldest university of Karnataka happens to be here in Dharwad. And it's my alma mater also because I did my BDS here in Dharwad. Uh, and during that time, we did not have Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences. So I was part of the university called as KUD, Karnataka University, Dharwad. So it's a very old university second only to Mysore University in Karnataka. It's a cultural capital of Northern Karnataka. Darwad has a very rich cultural uh, heritage. Some wonderful musicians, Hindustani classical musicians originate from Darwad. Uh, and Darwad uh, over the last uh, few centuries is uh, home to many immigrants. Well, I'm myself an immigrant, I'm an intrastate immigrant because I come from Mysore, but I've spent a good uh, 20 years of my life now here in Harvard. Uh, but there are so many other immigrants from different parts of India, Rajasthan, Gujarat, and some of these immigrants from Uttar Pradesh, when they came about 150 years ago, they developed this very unique sweet meat and uh, it has become popularly called as Dharwad Peda. So uh, this is a little bit about uh, the background to Dharwad. And I'm just going to show you some of the famous sons of Dharwad. I'm sure you have heard of the co-founder of Infosys, uh, Nandan Nilekani, who is also heading the uh, Aadha uh, two years ago. Uh, Pandit Bhimsen Joshi uh, is also someone who's from Dharwad district. The late uh, Girish Karnad, a very famous actor and uh, dramatist, author, he is also from Dharwad. So there are such innumerable luminaries who originate from Dharwad. And about 35 years ago, Dharwad also became the home of my dental institution called SDM College of Dental Sciences and Hospital. Now, uh, this uh, uh, dental college and hospital, the management of this hospital actually don't come from Dharwad. They come from coastal Karnataka. And uh, they actually uh, head a Shiva temple uh, in the tiny temple town of Dharmastada, which is very close to Manipal. So my institution name comes from the Shiva deity of this uh, a temple in the town of Dharmasthala. And uh, uh, the SDM uh, uh, family is very well renowned for many educational institutions all through the state. And recently, just two years ago, we have also become a state private university. So today my institution comes under Sri Dharmasthala Manjanateshwara University. And I'm very proud to say that just a couple of months ago, Outlook magazine rated our university as the number one emerging private university. So uh, this is a little bit about my institution, its management and some of the background to it. So with this, uh, let me head straight to the subject of today's uh, presentation, forensic odontology. First and foremost, however, I want to define the word forensic. What does forensic mean? Well, 
forensic uh, originates from the Latin word forum. Now, what does this word forum mean? Is that uh, in the Roman Empire, many of the cities had the central space called as the forum, wherein people would take their grievance and these grievances would get redressal. So effectively, any issues they had would be settled in this place called the forum. So the forum effectively served as a court of law. Therefore, forensic means uh, to be in front of the forum. So it's derived from the word forensis, which is to be before the forum. So broadly, we can say that anything that is related to the law can be equated with the word forensic. So then uh, what is a forensic odontology? A very simple way of defining forensic odontology is the branch of dentistry which deals with the law. Now you can interchange the terms forensic odontology with forensic dentistry. They both mean the same. Although the term forensic odontology has become more popular over the last 50, 60 years. Now, uh, as I said, this is a very simple definition and a more uh, appropriate definition is given by the Federation Dentaire International. It says that forensic odontology is that branch of dentistry, which in the interest of justice deals with the proper handling and examination of dental evidence and with the proper evaluation and presentation of dental findings. So effectively, forensic odontology's purpose is to address justice using the path of law. And how it does this is by carefully and properly handling tooth structures and associated tissue that may be recovered as part of a police investigation. And once this is examined and handled carefully, it has to be analyzed thoroughly. And then the interpretation has to be presented in a proper format. This presentation would be done in the form of a forensic uh, report as well as later if required as expert testimony in the court of law. Now, uh, forensic dentistry has uh, evolved and developed quite a lot in the last 70, 75 years. So much so that today we have different areas within forensic dentistry. Perhaps the most uh, important aspect of forensic odontology is to identify individuals, dead individuals from their dentition. So the term post-mortem comparative dental identification may be used. So this is perhaps the more, most common application of forensic dentistry around the world, not necessarily in India, and I'll come to that shortly. But this is perhaps the most commonly used application of forensic dentistry in many countries, that is identification of dead individuals. Now, uh, there's another type of identification and that's called as reconstructive identification. Notice the difference between the first and second bullets is the word comparative in the first bullet and the word reconstructive in the second bullet. So comparative dental identification is something different. What I'm referring to now is reconstructive dental identification. And reconstructive dental identification is uh, relevant to the identification of skulls. So we may have to ascertain what is the population affinity of a skull, or we may need to tell the police whether the skull belongs to a male or female, or the police may be interested to know how old that individual was at the time of death. That would be age estimation. So these three constitute 
reconstruct dental identification now age estimation is not just undertaken in the dead it also has a lot of relevance in the living and perhaps 50% of age estimation cases we get relates to dead individuals 50% relates to living subjects so age estimation straddles both types of uh, state of life that is dead and living last but not the least bite mark investigation this is a very challenging but a very interesting area of forensic odontology so let me take you through each of these areas in this overview of forensic odontology now first and foremost i want to address the question why teeth are so important in identification now remember when a person dies of natural causes uh, a death certificate is issued as a matter of routine the person may have died in hospital or at home of ill health or some other medical condition and there is no real issue in so far as uh, providing a death certificate this concern but when we have individuals who have died a traumatic death it could either be suicide or it could be homicide or it could be accident and as a result of these the body is recovered and the face is unrecognizable in such cases one has to establish identity only after establishing identity would the death certificate be issued and only when the death certificate is issued can the family claim insurance inheritance etc so identification is at the core of allowing the surviving family members to get on with and continue with their lives of course there is also a humanitarian angle involved to it in that it supposed to bring something called as closure many times families may find it very difficult to wrestle with the fact that their loved one their body has not been recovered let alone identified so by recovering the dead body and identifying the dead body it brings a sense of some form of closure to the family members so that's at the humanitarian point of view so why teeth become so important in identification is because teeth are extremely strong and even when the bodies which are recovered look like this they may be burned they may be decomposed or they may be completely skeletonized even in such instances teeth survive teeth can be recovered and used to identify these individuals that's because teeth are the strongest structure in our body they last uh, centuries after death perhaps even millennia so therefore teeth are very robust and they are able to survive uh, high speed trauma decomposition burial fire etc so that's the value of using the teeth to identify dead bodies so now uh, what and how do we go about identifying a dead body with as i mentioned the post mortem dental identification includes something called as comparative dental identification and reconstructive dental identification so let me just quickly take you through comparative dental identification so here circumstantial evidence allows us to narrow down the possible identity of the dead person you see i mentioned earlier that the person may have died and the body may be decomposed or burned and the face may be unrecognizable 
and therefore we can't identify the person. So then how do we get an idea as to who the person is? The circumstantial evidence would be, for example, we may recover a wallet from the person's uh, body and that wallet may have some ID card or maybe the person has died in a car accident and although the car has caught fire and the body is badly burned, there's a chassis number or an engine number that gives us some clue as to who the car owner is and who the driver of the car is. So these are what circumstantial evidence refers to. And this gives us a sense as to who the person may be. We're not sure that it is really that person, but it gives us a clue as to who the dead individual is. And using that clue, we try to get hold of the dental records from the treating dentist. Of course, before that, we will ask the family members who the dentist is, and then locate the dentist, collect dental records. And what we try to do is compare the teeth on the dead person's body with the records recovered from the dentist. Well, this is what we do. So let's say we have a dead body, like what you see on the left-hand side here. We try to carefully look at the oral structures look at uh, the teeth, how many teeth are present, what are the teeth present, are there any restorations, are there any missing teeth, any other unusual features. And once all of this data is gathered, we then also look for specific features, such as, for example, uh, you know, this technique alloy restoration, which you notice is uh, put on uh, one five and one six and then this data which is referred to as post-mortem data this post-mortem data is compared with something called as the anti-mortem data anti-mortem data is nothing but data which we would have recovered from the dental record data which is obtained from when the person was alive and you can see the similarity here. You can appreciate the similarity in so far as the restoration on 1.5 and 1.6 is concerned. And such similarities between the anti-mortem record and the post-mortem data allows us to link the two sets of data and establish identity. So this in a nutshell is how comparative dental identification is undertaken. And as I mentioned earlier, this is something that is done very commonly in many Western countries. So if you went to the US or Europe or Australia, or maybe even countries such as Japan and Malaysia, here in Asia itself, they'll probably say that this is what they do very often, but not so in India. In India, it's something else that we do very commonly. And again, I'll come back to that in a short while. In India, we also undertake reconstructive identification quite often. As I mentioned earlier, this is uh, something that can be undertaken where uh, we need to assess the population affinity, the sex of the individual, and the age of the dead person. So these three effectively gives us the identity profile of the dead person. Profile is nothing but an outline, a sketch. So we get a rough idea as to who that person may be. Here, there is no circumstantial evidence. So remember, unlike in comparative dental identification, where we had some identification card or you know, a car chassis number here, there's nothing available. All that we have is a bag of bones, maybe a skull recovered in some isolated place. So there's just no clue as to who that person is. And it's in such cases that we try to determine age, sex, population, and we give this information to the police and they can 
compare it to their missing persons record and try to determine who the skull may belong to. That's the purpose of reconstructive identification. So uh, let's begin with the first aspect of reconstructive identification. That is population identification. And we can identify population simply because of variations that exist in different populations around the world. You see, you look at people around the world, we all look different. And that's largely because of centuries of adaptation which the human body has undergone as a result of exposure to the local environment that we live in. So it may be the light skin one has or the dark skin another person has, the narrow nose with long nostrils or the broad nose, all of these, the epicampic fold which you see in people of Eastern Asia, all of these are adaptations to local environmental influences, weather, temperature, amount of sunlight, and these are all scientifically established. So consequently, we all look different. And what's interesting is, it's not just externally that we look different around the world. Even when you look at the dentition, there may be features of teeth which may vary from population to population. I'm sure you all have heard of Carabelli cusp. So Carabelli cusp is supposed to be found in relatively moderate frequency in many populations around the world but in a relatively low frequency in some other populations. Likewise, there's a feature called shoveling. Shoveling is something that you get to see in the anterior teeth, especially upper incisors. So here we have prominent marginal ridges on the palatal aspect. So these prominent marginal ridges of incisors are supposed to be found more often in certain populations and less often in certain other populations. There are more than 25 such features, and these can be used to get some idea about the population affinity of skulls. Now, in addition to population affinity, we can also try to determine whether the skull belongs to a male or female. And trying to determine whether the skull belongs to a male or female can be extremely crucial because by and large, 50% of the population is male, 50% is female. So if you were to say that the skull belongs to a male, that really helps the police in their, in their investigation simply because they can now exclude the possibility of it being a female and they can just focus on one half of the population. Now, uh, we have many features that differentiate males and females on the skull. But as a forensic odontologist, I'm very keen to look at certain differences in the teeth. And measuring the teeth is a quick and convenient supplementary method to identify the sex. And uh, how do we measure the teeth? Very simple, really. All that you need to do is obtain the mesiodistal and buccolingual measurements. And these measurements need to be obtained using something called as a digital caliper. And then it can be substituted in certain formulas. And these formulas predict whether the skull or mandible belongs to a male or a female. Now the accuracy of sex prediction using teeth is usually not more than 75%. So you need to keep in mind that one in four cases of sex prediction using the teeth may be wrong. You may get an erroneous result in one fourth of all cases. So from that point of view, making use of the skull, the long bones, the pelvic bone may be definitely more accurate in terms of sex prediction. But the advantage teeth have is that teeth are extremely robust and there are so many cases where other bones are simply not available or even if available, they are fragmented and damaged. And therefore there's very little else apart from the teeth that we can make use of in sex prediction. 
So again, the strength of the field is really, well, it's strength. Now, finally, I wish to talk about age estimation. Well, uh, age may be predicted from structural changes that occur in the teeth. These structural changes may be appreciated either on impact teeth or we may be able to appreciate it uh, histologically for which of course we need to section the teeth or you can just obtain radiographs and try to appreciate these changes using certain X-ray based methods. So age estimation is the most common application of forensic dentistry here in India. And my experience is that about two thirds of all cases that come to us relates to age estimation. And as I said earlier, about half of them relate to post-mortem age estimation and half of them relate to living age estimation. Now, when it comes to post-mortem age estimation, and that is what we are still talking about, because remember, we are talking about reconstructive dental identification. So here we can extract the teeth and once we extract the teeth, we can section it and we can look for a variety of changes. And one very easy uh, way of estimating age is to look for the amount of sclerotic dentin. Translucency of root dentin goes on increasing as we grow older. So in a 20 year old, it may be negligible. In a 30 year old, it may be slightly more. 35, 40 years, it increases even more. And as we go into old age, there's a lot more translucency. So basically the length of translucent dentin is actually more as a person grows older. And this is what allows us to use this variable, use this feature in predicting age. But remember, this is something that can be done only in dead individuals because it requires tooth extraction. In living individuals, however, we make use of radiographs. And uh, living age estimation can be undertaken either in very young individuals. For example, uh, it could be to determine whether a person has reached age 18, which is the age of majority in India. That would be very important in a variety of circumstances. For example, example, voting rights, consent, applying for a government job. And of course, that's the age of uh, eligibility for marriage for females in India. It could also be for 14 years age estimation, because that's the age at which a person can legally start to work. Any child who's less than 14 years who's working, that would constitute child labor. So there are several cases we may get that uh, asks the question, is this individual less than 14 years or has he or she attained the age of 14? It could also be used for predicting age of 21 because that's the age of marriageability for males. Although it becomes a little more difficult as the person grows older to predict age, it may still be done. Of course, age estimation in adults, in a 30-year-old or a 50-year-old, can also be undertaken using a variety of other methods, mostly which look at the amount of secondary dentin deposition radiographically. So this, uh, in a nutshell, is about reconstructive dental identification, which includes age estimation also. Finally, I wish to talk about bite mark investigation. Now, as I mentioned earlier, bite mark investigation is a very challenging area. And in the last 10 years or so, it's gained a little bit of controversy also. Now, uh, the theory behind bite mark investigation is that uh, sex offenders will usually bite their victims, leaving behind bite marks. And these bite marks made by each of us 
is very unique in nature. And because of that uniqueness, because the way the teeth are arranged in each and every one of us is so different, leaving behind these very unique marks, because of that uniqueness, it can be compared to the accused person's teeth. And we can try to establish a link. But in the last 10 years, uh, there have been several studies which have questioned this underlying basis of uniqueness of bite mark uh, pattern, so to speak. There are a few studies which have tried to establish the uniqueness. And there are others which have said that it is not necessarily unique. So that's why I said that it is quite controversial. But I believe that if you are able to collect the bite mark evidence properly and investigate it very carefully, judiciously, uh, it will have a lot of uh, use and impact on certain cases. Not always, but definitely in certain cases, it will be of extreme use. So with this background, let me just tell you that uh, what we are trying to look at is the incisor surfaces of the accused person's dentition, trying to compare this with the bite marks. And of course, the incisor surfaces of the teeth uh, would be seen very clearly on dental casts. So one of uh, the very important evidence that needs to be collected from an accused person is the dental cast of the relevant teeth. And usually we will ask for both the upper as well as the lower impressions and casts. Now, the other very important piece of evidence that needs to be collected properly is photographs of bite mark. Ultimately, the success of a bite mark case may very well hinge on the quality of photos that have been taken. So if the photos are not of good quality, then chances are we may not be able to proceed with that investigation. So the photos have to be taken properly with the scale. The camera has to be placed right above the bite mark. And I think you will see this in some of the photos which I'll be showing you in a couple of slides. Now, why bite marks become so useful is because they are found in sex crimes. As I mentioned in the first slide of bite marks, usually it's a uh, uh, something that is found in crimes of a sexual nature, but it can also be found in fights, it can also be found in abuse. It could be child abuse, it may be domestic abuse, it may be elder abuse. In all such instances, we can come across bite marks. So the key would be to collect this bite mark evidence properly and thoroughly compare it with the accused person's dentition. And this is how a bite mark has to be photographed. You notice that the camera has been placed in a manner where the lens is right above the bite mark. So you can clearly also appreciate that a scale has been placed right next to the bite mark. The scale does not cover the bite mark. So it's right next to the bite mark, but it does not obstruct any of the bite mark evidence. And also very important, the scale is placed on the same surface as the bite mark. Notice that the scale is very gently touching the skin on which the bite mark is also present. So this is the right way of taking a bite mark photo. Now I'm sure if you look closely at this bite mark uh, photograph, you'll be able to appreciate that we have both the maxillary as well as the mandibular arches. The maxillary arch is at the top and the mandibular arch is at the bottom. Again, if you look close, I'm sure you'll also be able to appreciate the maxillary central incisors, both right and left. I'm sure you can also appreciate the maxillary left lateral incisor and perhaps a little bit of the maxillary left canine. So we have the right side teeth, which would be on the right hand side the left side teeth, which would be on the left hand side. When it comes to the lower 
it appears to be anterior teeth here. Perhaps these are the incisors. I would imagine that uh, these could well be the um, maybe we have the right lateral, right central, left central, and I think this would be the left canine. And I'll tell you why this is not the left lateral when you have a look at the cast in the next slide. So we've now analyzed the bite mark carefully on the photo. And next we are looking at the casts. And you notice that the left lateral incisor, and yes, this is the left side teeth, not the right side teeth, because I have flipped the image. I have flipped it because we need to correct the mirror imaging. So when you visualize the cast, the way we look at the cast, it's actually a mirror image. So that mirror imaging does not exist in bite mark analysis. So we have to correct that mirror imaging. So therefore, what you see here on the right hand side are actually the right side teeth. What you see here on the left hand side are actually the left side teeth. You can notice the markings of the scale. They look reversed. So that tells you that the image has been corrected for mirror imaging. So as I was saying, uh, we have the left lateral incisor, which is slightly lingually placed and probably slightly below the occlusal plane. And that's why it has not registered on the bite mark. And that's the reason that I mentioned that what we see here is the left canine. So those are the four teeth. Basically left lateral, left central, I'm sorry, right lateral, right central, left central, as well as the left canine. And these teeth, you will notice that I have painted it and uh, highlighted it in red color because it's these incisal surfaces that I need to compare with the bite marks. And that's what I will show you in the last slide. That is the superimposition. Superimposition of the incisor edges of the accused person's dentition onto the bite mark. And you will see that the fit is so neat. The alignment of the incisal uh, edges on the accused person's dentition corresponds very well with the alignment of the teeth on the bite mark and the tooth numbers, the tooth types, they are all corresponding uh, quite well. And this allows us to say that, yes, this bite mark was indeed made by the dentition we just saw. Of course, the wordings we use will be slightly different. We have uh, uh, several uh, grades of conclusions. We call them as degrees of certainty of limb. So we'll say that uh, there's reasonable degree of certainty that this bite mark was caused by this dentition, or we'll also use terms such as probably. That means it's not definite, but most probably this was caused by the dentition. Or if you have more doubts in your mind, you can also just say that possibly this dentition cannot be excluded from having caused the bite mark. So it's not a, a clear cut or straightforward yes or no answer we will give uh, answers in uh, different degrees of certainty based on the amount of evidence that we have and based on how sure we are as far as the link is concerned. So this uh, in a nutshell is about uh, forensic odontology. So what we've covered over the last uh, 40, 45 minutes is uh, uh, comparative dental identification wherein we saw how uh, uh, teeth in the dead person can be compared with dental records and the identity established. We've also seen how population affinity can be assessed, how sex can be determined, and also how age can be estimated. And uh, last but not the least, in uh, cases related to crimes, how an accused uh, criminal can be linked to the crime that that person has committed 
especially in terms of the bite mark. So to conclude, the teeth and dental evidence can prove vital in forensic cases, but it's extremely important that we properly collect this evidence and we thoroughly analyze this evidence. And if that is done, then it can certainly assist the law and in the furtherance of justice. With that, uh, I conclude my presentation and I take the opportunity to thank uh, Savita Dental College and Hospitals in Chennai. And I'm grateful to Dr. Shija Vergis, who is the Dean of the institution, and also the Department of Oral Pathology for their initiative, and in particular, Dr. Abhirami for having uh, taking the initiative to invite me and organizing this uh, presentation. I also thank all the participants from far and wide for your interest. And uh, I'm very happy to take any questions that you may have. So with this, uh, uh, Dr. Abhirami, I will request you to kindly take over and direct uh, any questions that have been uh, raised uh, to me. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, sir. It's a wonderful presentation and uh, behalf of Savita Dental College and uh, our oral pathology department, I am thanking you for your uh, valuable time, sir. And Thank you. Thank you so much. My I pleasure. think uh, the questions are there, sir, actually. Can I uh, read the questions, sir? Sure, sure. Please do. Uh, it is from Arpita. Is it, uh, her question is like, is it possible for human cells to be in absolute contact with fully mineralized tissue and stay alive and stay active long periods for a long period of time? Like that she is asking, sir. Uh, could you repeat that, please? I did not understand. Is it possible for human cells to be in absolute contact with fully mineralized tissue and stay alive and stay active for long time period? Um, I'm not sure in what uh, context uh, this question has been put forth, but uh, if the question is whether uh, DNA analysis can be undertaken from the teeth, then the answer is yes. There are uh, several cases over the last 20 years or so wherein dental DNA evidence has been used to identify individuals and of course uh, DNA from saliva also has been used to identify perpetrators of bite marks. You see bite mark is a physical evidence but the saliva that may be left on the bite mark containing sloughed epithelial cells they are basically biological evidence and that has also been used to identify perpetrators. So I hope that answers the question, although I'm not sure. Yes, sir. Uh, hope uh, for Arpita, the answer is in uh, like uh, useful. And the second question is uh, from Dr. K. V. Shwati. Thank you, sir. And uh, your view on keloscopy. How about its scope in personal identification? Uh, I'll say it's almost zero because uh, keloscopy back in the 1970s, I think was used by maybe Tsuchihashi and some of his other colleagues in Japan to establish identity in crime related cases. That is uh, criminals of perpetrated crimes. So it wasn't really used in identification of dead individuals. So you see the application of keloscopy is a little similar to bite mark investigation in that it may be used in crime investigation. Unlike T, unlike post-mortem identification where we use T, I don't really see any value of keloscopy in post-mortem identification simply because teeth have become so important to post-mortem identification because they are hard tissue and they're able to survive all kinds of destruction post-mortem. Lips, keloscopy, remember, we are referring to lip prints. The lips are soft tissue and like other parts 
of the skin and soft tissue, they're likely to be extensively damaged. And therefore, uh, I personally haven't really seen any case of post-mortem identification from keloscopy. And even in relation to identification of criminals using keloscopy, it's very, very rare. So therefore, I personally would not recommend uh, keloscopy until and unless there's absolutely nothing else left, then perhaps we can consider it. But from a practical point of view, uh, no, keloscopy has almost no real life application. Thank you, sir. And for Dr. Swati, it'd be useful, I guess. And the another question is like uh, from uh, Vijay Yadav. Does forensic odontology help in finding lost individuals? Very good question. I think there are maybe one or two cases which I recall where uh, individuals, uh, for example, uh, old individuals who wandered away and got lost, I think have been uh, successfully identified and returned to their homes. Uh, so such examples do exist. So it can, it can be possible. To answer your question, yes, it is possible. But again, it will be very rare, uh, very rare, but uh, it, is, it is known to happen. Okay, sir. And uh, another question is from Dr. Abhilasha. Uh, what is the relevance of computer software in comparison and conclusion? Um, I'll say it, uh, it is like using a spoon to eat. Ultimately, you hold the spoon. The spoon is merely helping you eat in a slightly more convenient way or in a slightly more organized way. You need to do the eating. You need to do the chewing. You need to do the holding of the spoon. So I'll uh, say it's something similar. So software will be merely assisting you. And of course, the assistance can be in a very huge way, particularly when it comes to disaster victim identification, where there are hundreds of post-mortem and anti-mortem data. To manually do it can be very tedious. Therefore, the software can bring down the comparisons to just a few. So that way, it really helps in sorting things out. But I would imagine that uh, ultimately, the final authority on saying whether this particular individual's dentition uh, corresponds with this set of dental records, that decision comes down to a human decision. So the software gives us a few possible scenarios as to which individual can be correlated with which dental record. But then based on that short listing, we will have to ultimately finalize the identification. So that's the role of uh, software as far as identification is concerned. It's uh, no doubt very helpful, but the final decision on identification would be a human decision. Yes, sir. And the another question from Deep T, yes. By the way, if I may just, uh, Interrupt you, Dr. Abhirami. That no, sir. No, 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 sir. That was an excellent question. And I hope uh, the answer uh, was useful. Huh. Thank you for the question, Dr. Abhilasha, ma'am. And uh, another one question from Deepti, yes, sir. Like, uh, there have been various high profile cases where bite mark analysis has identified the criminal, but also other cases where innocent people have been accused wrongly. Has this happened in your work experience, sir? Like, uh, what is your say uh, like, uh, on this credibility? Uh, uh, to my knowledge, uh, no one has come forward uh, claiming that they have been wrongly uh, implicated in any of the bite mark related opinions rendered by me. And I think uh, the examples that uh, uh, sorry, is it Dr. Deepti? Uh, Dr. Yes, Deepti? sir, Deepti, yes. So the examples which Dr. Deepti is 
referring to i think could largely come from the west especially in the us now this has perhaps happened uh, in large numbers maybe in the 1970s also in the 1980s and that's why there's so much of guilt and overzealousness in trying to overcompensate for that also by trying to say that uh, bite mark investigation has issues i always believe that uh, uh, as long as you go with the evidence as long as you look at the evidence objectively and uh, use it judiciously the uh, chances of wrong doing from a forensic uh, investigator will be grossly minimized so i think uh, uh, we always need to be careful in whatever opinion we render we have to be very careful and i myself very careful in uh, most of the opinions that i render especially when it comes to bite mark investigation it may also be in relation to age estimation remember bite mark investigation if we say yes this bite mark was made by this person there's every possibility that person gets a jail term so you know we are conscious about that i am conscious about that similarly when it comes to age estimation if i say that a person a boy who is accused in murder is more than 18 years i'm very conscious of the fact that there is a possibility that person now becomes eligible for all kinds of criminal punishment so we are aware of this but at the same time we are independent of such uh, you know emotional feelings simply because we ultimately need to go with the evidence and we and if the evidence is saying that it is going in this direction we have to take that direction so therefore uh, we have to get it with a very stone cold attitude in a very unbiased way and uh, yes that would be the right way to do it unfortunately it may not have happened in several cases in the west uh, therefore uh, uh, you know these questions are being raised now rightly so so for us in india it should serve as a kind of a cautionary tale not to be over zealous in the opinions that we get be very uh, mature be very objective uh, not necessarily subdued but be very moderate in the way we go ahead with our opinions that would be the right approach ultimately just follow the evidence and uh, things should be more or less fine yes sir that's a wonderful answer and the another question is like uh, why uh, from uh, patel bhumi why only abfo number 2 scale is used for bite mark analysis now uh, i think the first abfo scale was improved that's why abfo number 2 the number is number 2 because it's a second version of that scale which had improvements of over the first version now that is not the only scale that can be used there are several other l shaped scales that have been developed subsequently so perhaps any of those l shaped scales can be used what i have noticed is that the abf number 2 scale is quite sturdy it is i think 3 ply many other scales are just 2 ply so it's a lot more flexible abf number 2 mm-hmm. is like a more rigid more sturdy uh, so and i had it for a good uh, 14 years maybe 13 14 years it's not more uh, but i'm not going to say that you have to use only that but it's a standard scale no doubt that it's a standard scale in the absence of an apf scale you can use any other scale just make sure you use a scale that would be my uh, request uh, when when it comes to bite mark photography you can use any other scale preferably a metallic scale the uh, half a foot 15 cm metallic scale which i think most dentists would be using from their bds test that would be a, a good scale to use if abf scale is not available yes sir and the another question from dr renita good morning sir what is the potential of forensic odontology from a research perspective 
and what uh, areas in forensic odontology needs more research? Uh, little, the question is like little uh, interesting, sir. What areas in forensic odontology needs more research? Absolutely. Uh, it's a very broad based question and I'll say that the research potential is huge. Now, I also want to mention that uh, and I've been saying this uh, to my students here, even to my colleagues here for many years, if not more than a decade. What matters is not the topic of research. What really matters is how you undertake that research. So the research methodology is most important. The statistical analysis you use and very important your ability to interpret the results. You should be able to understand the statistics and if you know what the statistical method is, then it helps you in understanding the numbers, the results which that statistical analysis gives you. So the key to a good research would be that, the methodology. Uh, now, uh, uh, forensic, in my own personal opinion, Forensic dentistry has a huge uh, research potential. Um, you know, especially earlier in my career, I used to publish a lot of research papers. I myself was surprised that I was able to publish so much and that to in top uh, forensic science journals. Um, so I, and I think many others have followed after that. So I think the potential is still there. It's still huge. Um, many people were of, uh, uh, wrong impression that because it's a new subject in India, therefore we can uh, publish more research in that. That's not really true. I'll really make sure again, the methodology is what is uh, sound. If the methodology is sound, any specialty, you can publish uh, research papers. So therefore, I'll say that forensic odontology in particular, there's tremendous potential. But dentistry as a whole, there's a lot of uh, research potential. Second part of the question, what areas within forensic odontology? I'll say it doesn't matter. Ultimately undertake research based on uh, uh, area which interests you and which you think has practical application. See, don't undertake research just for the sake of undertaking research. Research, in my opinion, has to be undertaken to address a question in your mind which would have a real life implication. So there is some method I want to undertake or there's some issue that I have been facing in my real life forensic cases. So when I face that issue, I want to get deeper into why I'm facing that issue. What is the solution for that issue? So that is how you try to undertake research. So this has to be a theory or a question in your mind and you need to address that theory or address that question. So research has to be driven by a practical problem that you're facing. So don't just do research for the sake of publishing it. That may be you know, very fashionable to do, but ultimately no one is going to read those research articles which has no practical implication. So, Therefore, make sure the research you undertake, it may be in age estimation, it may be in bite mark investigation, it may be in anything, it may be even something related to teaching in forensic dentistry, but it has to have a practical implication. So uh, that would be an area which would be fertile for research, a practical issue that you're facing. Sir, I think Kanada, some uh, three questions are there. Are you okay with that, sir? We can. Can we? Uh, it's just past 11. Sure, maybe in another five minutes I can take it yes, and wrap sir. it up. Uh, yeah, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And from yeah. Dr. Rajesh, what are the different uh, form available for report, like forensic report writing? He's asking about that only, sir. Okay. Different types now, of forms. Uh, I never have actually used any form for forensic report writing. Uh, ultimately, uh, Forensic report writing is like writing a formal letter. The police have asked you a question. They've asked you to help them out with something. And the report you're writing is a response to their question, a response to what they have asked, what the police have asked. So effectively, 
the report I write is basically what I have done. So in this case, I have done this, I've done this, you know, these are the methods I've used and these are the findings I've got. This is my conclusion. So there's no real format that I have followed, but I can give you a couple of references to uh, writing reports. The first is the IOFOS, International Organization for Forensic Odontostomatology. Just go to iofos.eu, EU for Europe. Yeah. So iofos.eu, they, they have certain uh, guidelines on report writing. So especially age estimation guidelines, personal identification guidelines, etc. Uh, with respect to bite mark report writing, I'll recommend you to go to the ABFO website. That is the American Board of Forensic Odontology. So ABFO guidelines on report writing for bite marks would be very useful. So just go to these two websites, IOFO and uh, I think it's ABFO. That should give you the information and maybe, I won't say format, but we definitely give guidelines sir. for writing reports. Okay, sir. And then uh, from Shishra, like, sir, what about palatal ruge analysis in crime scene investigation, like crime investigation? Not useful. Not useful. Not then, useful at all. Again, uh, simply because uh, crime investigation okay. palatal ruge won't be of use. They may be of use in identification of so if you have a dead person with no teeth, edentulous, and that person had an old denture lying at home, then maybe you can compare the ruge pattern from the old denture which was recovered at home with the ruge pattern on the dead body. Or maybe that person is a denture wearer. The dead person himself or herself is a denture wearer. So, and maybe you will get a cast from that person's dentist. So compare the ruge pattern on the cast, which you recovered from the dentist, with the ruge pattern either in the mouth or on the denture. That may assist you in uh, establishing item. So these are, again, very rare cases. Um, so I'll uh, say as far as crime investigation is concerned, no. Keloscopy may be useful in crime investigation. Rugoscopy may be useful in identification of dead bodies. Yes. But again, both keloscopy and rugoscopy have very, 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 very limited role and application in real life forensic dentistry. And yeah, sir, the another person he was asking about like uh, forensic odontology after BRC, uh, can we join, it is possible to join in uh, forensic odontology like that? But after? After BRC forensic course, it is possible to get into forensic what orientology. I did not understand BRC. BRC forensic science after the after finishing okay. that course. Okay. Now uh, I think forensic orientology is something that I would imagine would be open to dentists per se. So if the person does not have a background in dentistry, it may be very difficult for that person to join a forensic dentistry. Uh, I think most of the courses abroad as well as the courses in India, by and large, say that to undertake a forensic odontology course, the minimum requirement is to have a bachelor of dental surgery. So you must have a BDS, which means you effectively must be a dentist to pursue forensic odontology. Yes, sir. The last question, will it be prudent to get like, uh, I think the question got, yes, sir. Like, uh, will it be prudent to get second or third opinions and co signs in a bite mark analysis report yes, before submission to court? Yes, absolutely. I think many of the guidelines themselves recommend having uh, multiple opinions. So it's yeah. absolutely fine. Okay, you can sir. get multiple opinions. Uh, two, three people can sit together, come to a common uh, conclusion, come to a consensus, and then submit the uh, report with the co-signatories saying very clearly that this conclusion is based on the decision of all of us. It may be two people, it may be three people. Yes, absolutely. You can have multiple opinions and uh, write your report. Yes, sir. Sir, actually one person, uh, Dr. Rohan is asking about what is your opinion on introducing 
forensic odontology at a master's level and what does dci stand like our dental council of india stands okay now i'll just quickly mention here that uh, i do not think it would be a good idea to have a master uh, uh, of dental surgery in forensic odontology i think it would be better to have a slightly shorter term forensic odontology course it could be a diploma in forensic odontology or something similar to that post graduate diploma in forensic odontology which could be a two year course so i don't uh, mind having a one year or a two year full time program in forensic odontology a masters degree may be a bit far fetched as of now simply because we may not have enough people to uh, train such dentists maybe in the distant future we could have that option but as of now i think it would be prudent to have courses which are one year or two year full time uh, courses in forensic uh, odontology and i'm not very sure about what the dci is contemplating in this matter i really don't know i know that dci has introduced forensic odontology at the ug level uh, as part of oral medicine and oral pathology to be taught in third year and fourth year bds uh, but uh, at the pg level i don't think uh, dci has uh, specifically said anything about having masters and i don't know what their plan is in the near future uh, but yes personally i feel it would be better to have one year or two year full time courses rather than a full fledged uh, mds uh, i think that we can have something similar Uh, after 10 15 years uh, i really don't think it would be very useful now yes sir the questions that's also the questions got over and uh, got a greetings from our uh, department hod sir like uh, sir uh, dr herald j sharlin he um, conveyed the message thank you so much sir it's a wonderful presentation and looking forward for having more sessions on advances in forensic odontology Thank you so much. Once again, my thanks to you, Dr. Abhirami. Thanks to the Department of Oral Pathology. Thanks to your institution, the Dean, Madam, and all the participants for logging in to share in this uh, presentation of forensic odontology. My uh, email address is right here at the bottom of the screen. Any additional queries, uh, uh, participants are most welcome to just uh, uh, drop me an email. I'll try my best to uh, answer their uh, questions. thank you once again for the opportunity thank you so much sir we are looking forward for more, more things in forensic odontology and uh, always uh, we need your blessing sir and i always need your blessing sir always a pleasure thank yes, you sir. so much and i'll uh, mail your certificates and uh, i'll do the further things sir thank you so much sir thank you thank you once again yes sir I'll nice to up. meet you here sir i'm really happy that i just i did it Thank you. Thank you so much. This okay, is all mine. Take okay, care. Sir. Okay, sir. You too. Take care, sir. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, sir. Ah, you do recording is automatic. Save it, you know. Leave meeting. Put it on.